continue with our study of 2 Timothy. We're in chapter 2. It's one of Paul's most intimate, personal letters to his friend and protege, Timothy. He, he knows he's at the end of his life. He knows that one of these days, they're going to pull him up and out of that cistern that's a prison, and they're going to execute him in some way. He doesn't know how that's going to happen. But he takes the time at the end of his life to write a very personal, very practical letter to his friend and protege, Timothy. Say, Timothy, here's some final things that I want you to remember. And we've looked at it, a number of them so far. Uh, the last one we left off talking to Timothy, it was Paul probably being um, not harsh, but being very serious and saying, Timothy, please, you must hold on to the word of God. You must not be distracted by all these discussions and all these disputing of, of various words and concepts. Stay faithful to the word of God. Well, how about today? Where do we go? When we get to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 20 through the end of the chapter and verse 26, what is Paul going to talk about? He's going to talk about this, useful service. Useful service. There are times when I feel like my service to the Lord is very useful, and there are times when I say, I, I don't feel very useful at all. Like, Lord, what, what are you trying to say? I don't feel like I'm being effective. I don't feel like I'm being helpful. What do you want me to know? If you were the Apostle Paul sitting in that prison, if you were concerned about your condition and the fact that you were going to die, you could feel that the Apostle Paul was sitting there going, Lord, I don't feel very useful. I'm at the end of my life. I've served you well. I don't have an opportunity to serve anymore. I, I'm not very useful to you. What, what would you like me to do? I don't think Paul ever had that feeling. I really feel like wherever Paul was, whether he was traveling in a ship or spending time in the city of Ephesus or in Corinth or on his way to prison or back to Jerusalem or on to Antioch, I feel like Paul understood that he was being useful in his service to the Lord, whatever form that would take. He did not define his usefulness by the number of churches he started or by the number of converts. Nowhere do we see in any of Paul's writing a list or, or taking credit for how many churches he started. We never find a number of people that he introduced to Christ. What we find is Paul simply being faithful and being useful to the Lord wherever he is, whatever he's doing, in whatever capacity that he can. So when we get to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 20 through 26, he helps Timothy come to a very clear understanding of what useful service looks like. I think this is very important for us who live in the 21st century, that sometimes we get so programmatic or so pragmatic or so focused on doing this or doing this or adding up this particular number or leading this many people to Christ that we forget what usefulness to the Lord really looks like, that the gospel of Jesus Christ motivates us to live, to talk, to reinforce that our belief drives our behavior. If I could share with you in one sentence what we're about to see, I would say it this way. Christ-centered, gospel-oriented service is not measured in money or people. It's measured in character. It's married, measured in focus. Sometimes, especially in America, we get focused on the amount of dollars that a project will take or how much it's going to take to finance an operation or the number of people that we have. In fact, when I'm here and people ask, well, how large is your church? I'm almost reluctant to say how many people is in our church because what if that ends up making you feel like, well, your church is much smaller, so maybe it's not effective. That's not it. What's important for useful service is character and focus our integrity before God, our integrity in the church, our, our integrity in the world, demonstrated in a godly character, but our focus on the gospel of Jesus Christ. So let me read for you 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 20 through 26. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 20 through 26. This is what it says. Now, in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay some for honorable use, some for dishonorable. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. 
have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth, and that they may escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. Now, taking all those verses together, let's break it down into two sections. Verses 20 and 21, I would simply call it this, being a vessel for useful service. Being a vessel for useful service. I'm intrigued by his illustration that he begins with, in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but wood, clay, some for honorable use, some for dishonorable. So let's go back into the first century. So you're in the area of Asia. You're in the Mediterranean area, or in the Mediterranean Sea area, and the different seas that branch off from there, or a Roman culture. So let's imagine that you have a magnificent and beautiful home. It's up on this high hill, and it overlooks the Mediterranean Sea. You are fortunate enough to have enough money that you have servants, and you have all kinds of opportunities to cook and to house your family and any guests that would come, to, to come through your home. But let's go to the kitchen because that's where Paul focuses. You come into the kitchen and there are a variety of pots and pans and utensils to be used for cooking and other things. So over here, you have your finest cookware. It's made of gold. Oh, it, it's a precious metal. And you only use that for special occasion. Over there are vessels of silver. They too are very special in your household and you would use them to cook and prepare special meals. But also in your house, you have a set of very common, very everyday, ordinary utensils. They're not the ones that you put on display so that everyone can see. They're the ones that you kind of hide over here in the cupboard. When Paul talks about vessels of wood and clay, some for honorable use and some for dishonorable, it actually is kind of disgusting. In the first century culture, they didn't have toilets like we did. They used buckets. So they would use their clay pots or some of their wooden buckets for bathroom use. It would be smelly. It would be stinky. You would never think of using those utensils to cook quality food in. You would never use the gold utensils for the bathroom things. There was an order and there was a particular use for each one of the different kinds of utensils in the person's house. So when he says, some are for honorable use and some for dishonorable, that's what he's talking about here. It gets a little bit confusing. In the kitchen, there are things for special use. There are things for dishonorable use. But here's the idea. Let me give you this verse from the message paraphrase. This is how it writes it. In a well-furnished kitchen, there are not only crystal goblets and silver platters, but waste cans and compost buckets. Some containers used to serve fine meals, others to take out the garbage. Some are very special, some that you would use only when your best company comes over, some that are simply used to take out the garbage. That's kind of a, a very interesting a dichotomy of uses in their kitchen setting. That's where you get the notion that some utensils are used for honorable things like fancy dinners and some that are used for toilet products. So why would he use that particular example here? He's talking about the church. He's not saying that some of you in the church, you're as valuable as gold, but some of you are only worthwhile for, you know, toilet type of things. That's not what he's saying. He's saying that no matter whether an object is made of gold or whether it's made of silver or whether it's made of clay or whether it's made of wood, it can be used either for honorable things or dishonorable things. You are one of those utensils if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. You are part of the church of Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter the particular uh, material that you are made of or how God has made you or how God has gifted you. What matters is what you do with who you are or with what gifts that you have. He's saying that no matter how valuable you may appear, you can be used for either honorable means or dishonorable means. And that's what was happening in that church. There were people in that church 
who should have been serving the Lord as if of gold or silver. And because of all the distractions and all the dysfunction in their church, they actually were being used for compost. And he says, that's not the way it should work in that church. And all these things that were going, there was inaccurate teaching. And they would say, well, did you hear this? Oh, did you hear that? And this rumor would go around. Or maybe they were complaining about the music. Or maybe they were complaining about the particular teacher. He said, that's not the way the church of Jesus Christ is supposed to be. He has made you a vessel for Christ's use. Are you being used in an honorable or a dishonorable way? Everyone is useful for service, no matter who you are or how God has made you. So in verse 21, he says, Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself, from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use. The idea behind the word cleansing yourself is not just a casual washing, but a deep cleansing. For example, when, when it's supper time at our house, and we'll say, come for supper, supper's ready, wash your hands. When our children go to wash their hands, and if you listen in the bathroom, the water runs for about two seconds. You hear, shh. And they'll come to the table and you'll say, did you wash your hands? Yes, we did. Look, they're wet. And we'll say, did you wash with soap? Uh, nope. I say, back to wash your hands. And I want to hear that water running a lot longer than that. See, sometimes we think, well, if I just let the water run, wipe my hands off, I'm clean. Paul says, if you have allowed yourself to be used in a dishonorable way, it takes deep cleansing. You have to go down and search it out and pull out all the things that are bad about it. I was thinking about the way that sometimes our dishes get used. Now, my wife, my wife has a special set of dishes. We call them china. I don't know why it's called china. I don't know if they're made in china. But we have set away in a certain cabinet a set of special dishes. If any of you were to come to our house, Trudy would prepare a special meal, we would use the finest plates and the finest forks and the finest spoons and knives that we have. Imagine that if our children had taken out of that special cabinet where our china is and took it outside and played with it in the mud and in the dirt. And Trudy would come outside and, and she would look and she would look in the dirt and she would say, is that one of my nice plates? And she would get closer, and she'd, she'd brush off the mud, and she says, this is one of my very best plates. And she would call the children over. Of course, we would blame Sasha first. Sasha, did you take this plate out of mom's cabinet and use it to play in the, in the dirt? And she would say, yes, mom. Why? Well, Sasha, don't you understand that this plate is only to be used for the most special of our friends and a company who come to our house? But mom, I thought I could play with it anywhere. But, but Sasha, it could break. It's actually very expensive. And I would feel very bad if you would break this plate. But, but mommy, I didn't understand. So what Trudy would do is she would take that plate, and because there was dirt and maybe some gravel on it, she would say, I can't just wipe this off. If I do, it's going to scratch the surface. So what Trudy will do is she will come inside, and she'll take it in the sink, and she'll begin to rinse water very gently over the top. And some of the dirt begins to just kind of wash away. And some of the gravel begins to wash away. And eventually, all that's left is just kind of a, a small film on top of that plate. And then she'll begin to scrub it softly at first, and then more aggressively, until by the time she's done with soap and water and cleanser, she holds that plate up, and it's shiny, and it's clean, and it's ready for use again. We strive to serve the contemporary Christian community and with a variety of Christian educational and evangelistic resources. To see TVS Resource Base, please visit tvseminary.com. That's what Paul is saying with the use of how we serve the Lord. He said, I have made you a vessel. I have bought you with a price. You are precious to me. I have made you part of my family. I have adopted you into my family and into my kingdom. I want you to be used for honorable service. But when you fail, when you mess up, when you sin, 
He says, I want you to cleanse yourself from what is dishonorable. Then you will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy. That word holy and set apart, it's great that they're together, written that way, because that's what holy means. Holy means to be set apart for sacred service. I was telling you about Trudy's special plates. They are set apart for when special friends come over to our house, such as you would be if you came to our house. You are holy when you become part of God's family and part of God's church, and He sets you apart for sacred service. He says that's what you can be, useful to the master of the house and ready for every good work. That God can use you as individuals, as families, as churches for the glory of God. I think of what Paul wrote to the church in Corinth in his first letter. They had all kinds of troubles inside their church. They had sexual immorality. They had sin going on. If we were to use our example of these particular pieces of gold and silver and wood and clay, they would be dirty. They would be foul. And this is what Paul writes to them in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 9-13. through 13. I wrote you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world, or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother, if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed, or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. See, what the church in Corinth had done would taken their vessels to be used for holy purposes, for the glory of God and for the sake of the gospel, and they had stained them. They had gotten dirty. He says, I wanted you not to remove yourself from the world. I wanted you to be holy and set apart for me, that the church of God would be pure. He says, what you've done is instead you've been yelling at the world, condemning the world for the way that they act, when he said, inside your church, you are the ones who are filthy. You are the ones who are dirty. So what Paul is doing is he is severely rebuking those inside the church, not those outside. And this is where sometimes we get confused, especially in the Western culture. We think that our country should allow us to serve Christ in a certain way, and we get confused when the world acts like they are. They're not followers of Jesus Christ. He says, I don't condemn those who don't follow Jesus Christ. That's the work of the Holy Spirit in their hearts. What I want to do is look at you to see if you are living in a way that is honoring to God and to Jesus Christ. And the way that, that verse 21 concludes, he says, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. And the master of the house is none other than Jesus Christ himself. You're ready for service. You're ready to go. Friend, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ and the gospel has changed your life, how are you living your life? You say, well, I, I don't feel like I'm gold or silver. I feel like I'm clay or wood. That's okay. It doesn't matter who you are, what you look like, what's your occupation, what's your financial situation. He said, listen, some vessels are used for honorable purposes, some for dishonorable but God can use any of you, whoever you are, however you're made, for honorable purposes. You say, but I I'm not all that intelligent, and I don't know if I have a good future ahead of me. It's always about the gospel. It's always about the gospel. That God says, I I'm willing to use you, whoever you are, wherever you are, whenever you're available to me. I love how Peter writes in his first letter these words. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when, not if, but when, they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. That's the gospel. That isn't the gospel message, but it's what happens when people see the gospel in us. Don't worry, we're not asking for perfection. We're not asking that you never make mistakes. We know that the Lord has to clean us up. We know that we confess our sins, and he's faithful to confess our sins. He says, I want to be the kind of vessel, whatever material I'm made of, that God can use for his kingdom and for his glory. How am I supposed to do that? How does that happen? You say, Pastor Bruce, I understand. I want to be that kind of person, but I'm not sure how. 
That's what verses 22 through 26 explain. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300 or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.